What is the nicest thing you've ever done that no one knows about? Story one, after reading all of these inspiring and kind posts, I started feeling like a horrible person. I've had an idea of a really cool thing to do that I thought would brighten some people's day since I was a kid, but I've never actually tried it. I decided today was the day to give it a shot. So I drove down to the local giant, a grocery store, and walked up to the first employee I saw working at the cash register. I asked her, if you could have one thing in the store right now, what would it be? She smiled back at me, puzzled. I guess I would get a sandwich from the deli, she replied. Great, I said, which one? She was now smiling wider when she said, um, probably the one with grilled chicken and mushrooms. I nod and say, okay. Then I walk away, forcing myself not to look back as I walked. I went, got the only sandwich there with grilled chicken and mushrooms and came back to her line. She smiled at me again and said, I see you took my advice. I smiled back at her and swiped my credit card. After she handed me the receipt, she asked me if I would like a plastic or a paper bag for my sandwich. I quickly replied, neither. I want you have it and handed it to her. She looked back at me, again confused. Really? She said, absolutely. I hope you have a fantastic day. She just laughed a little and put the sandwich under the cash register. I then went and did the same thing for the other two people working the registers there. I got a SpongeBob balloon and a small cup of chocolate icing, small prices to pay for the looks on their faces. It's not nearly as profound and sentimental as all of the other posts here, but it made me feel like less of a jackass. Story two. This will probably get buried, but I'd like to get it out of me anyway. Last year, I ended up on an adolescent psychiatric ward because of pretty bad depression, to the sky, etc., etc. By that time, I didn't give a FCK about myself or my life. Another girl on the ward my age, there were about 12 of us at any time, was admitted one day. My first impression of her was that she seemed nice, but a bit odd and clearly a bit messed up. We all were circumflex, circumflex. We talk a little and we get to know each other. I told her I was there because of bad depression. She told me she was put in because of years of psychological physical bullying. She eventually became psychotic and depressed. It's probably important to note here now that I was a forever alone computer geek. Turns out my brain is my biggest enemy. Because when I don't give a shtick about me, myself and I, I can talk to girls well. So me and this girl are sitting in the chill-out room. Square room with beanbags and a camera in the ceiling. We are sitting there, me being depressed, here reading her manga, of which I knew very little about, didn't interest me much, but I found it quirky and could respect being different. We are talking and for the life of me can't remember what was said but she ended up leaning in and kissing me. Bearing in mind, I'm totally forever alone and totally inexperienced in this stuff, as well as having no interest in myself, and thus no one else as they can do better than me, etc., etc. Obviously, I shat happy bricks, but I went with it anyway. I did that because she had extreme trust issues, hated humanity from the bullying, so I thought I could maybe restore some of her faith in people. We continued both our first ever relationship for about a month before my intellectually ill self decided I was wasting other people's time in hospital. A year later, I'm not sure how I can gauge if it was the right thing to do. But one year later, she is back in a new school, has tons of really cool new friends, is always busy, has a great job, and is doing genuinely really well. I guess in a way, it may not be the best idea to let someone use you. I.e., I didn't give a cow about myself, knew she could do better, but maybe if she wants it, it might help. I got a lot of satisfaction out of the end result and haven't really ever told anyone. So if anyone has even read this, thanks for giving this your time. Have a good life. Story 3. I used to work in an office that would contact customers regarding hospital bills. We would basically fill in the blanks on hospital forms and use their insurance info to process payments. My day consisted of making and receiving phone calls regarding the visits while making sure the insurance records were complete. I had to make a call once to a woman, she answered, and as soon as I mentioned who I was, she just broke down. Curious as to the reason I used her name from the file and patched together what I could from her hospital record. It turns out her son had just graduated and passed away on his way home from college. His medical bills were in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, a common sight. But what wasn't common was that her insurance was refusing payments across the board, and that was unacceptable. Apparently, she was nearing the deadline for submittal, and if that happens, then the company would fight payments until the sun stops shining. So, against HIPAA and my better judgment, I had a friend in another department get me her information and her son's, I contacted her insurance carrier and posed as a doctor, making an authorized submittal. I contacted her again a few hours after it processed and told her. All she could do was thank me and broke down again. I double-checked the file a month later and they paid all of the bills. Story 4. It was a long while ago when I was a kid at school in elementary. I was that loner kid that no one really talked to, but I didn't mind because I moved a lot during that time. Anyways, the kids would always make fun of this girl just because she was tall and she wore thick glasses. I felt bad for her because it was every gender and race that made fun of her that you could think of. 
One day, she was out on the playground, and I noticed she was being harassed by a few kids. But it was a lot more physical and violent, punching her and calling her names. For kids, it was pretty brutal. And despite the fact that I was a loner and not exactly strong or big compared to anyone, I intervened and told the group of kids to back off. They questioned why I was backing her up, and I just said it was wrong to treat her so badly. She managed to run away in tears, and the other kids turned on me, got my peach kicked by them. But that girl the next day thanked me for standing up for her and noticed my bruises and hugged me, almost in tears. Years passed, and as she got older, she got more attractive and made friends, living a better life. But she never let any of her newfound attention get to her and treated everyone the same. Skip almost a decade, I broke off all connections to anyone from that school. But as I was browsing through Facebook, I noticed a girl that was on my suggested friends. It was the same girl, but her profile wasn't private. And I looked on her About Me section and written in it was, I don't remember your name anymore since it's been years, but I still remember that you stood up for me and it gave me inspiration to be a better person. I thank you for that. Story 5. I'm going to earn myself some downvotes here. I can feel it. So one semester when I was in college, some candy dealers moved into my apartment building. We knew they were candy dealers because they were quite open about it. Anyway, they got a puppy, a sweet little red-brown thing. I often stopped on my way in or out of the building to pet him and scratch his ears. They tended to sit out in front of the building most of the time. One day, I commented upon his sweet nature, and one of them said, Well, yeah, till we make him mean. I was pretty innocent of such things then, so I didn't understand. So I asked what he meant, and he said, You know, so he can asterisk fight asterisk. My blood went cold. I ached every time I stopped to play with the puppy after that, though I continued to be nice to the candy dealers, because that's just smart. Eventually, he got old enough for the mean-making to start. They put him on their patio in one of those air freight-type dog boxes with the little grates on the sides, but mostly solid. He was a mastiff and already quite big and couldn't even stand up in this dog box. They left him in there, no food, no water, no coming out to go potty. He cried and cried. I called the police, nothing. The second day, he only started crying when he heard someone coming. I called the police, nothing. The third day, he only gave a little whimper when I called to him. I called the police, nothing. Late that night, I put dog food and water and bowls in my car. I crept up to the patio. He whimpered when I got there, but I cooed to him softly and he quieted. I opened the dog box and he came bounding out. I realized I hadn't thought to bring a collar and leash and panicked, thinking I was going to be chasing this stolen dog around in the middle of the night. I called him to me though and he came and pressed up against my side a little and we walked quickly to my car. We drove off. A few miles later, I fed him and watered him and used a rope I had in the trunk to take him potty. Then I drove to my mom's house in the suburbs, well away from those bastards. He found a home with a family in that neighborhood. Kids, big fenced yard, he was an indoor dog. He was very happy. That was 11 years ago now, and he was a mastiff, so he might not be living anymore. But he will have had a happy life if not. The candy dealers might have suspected me. I was never sure. They weren't really the sort to call in the constabulary. They never said anything, and I kept treating them the way I always had. Probably they thought the little four, ten inches white girl wasn't up to such a task. She was. Story 6. A few years ago, I was working as a contractor up in a remote camp in Afghanistan. One of the cool things to do there is to visit the gem markets. This one in particular I loved because the Afghan man was super sweet and would help me pick out the best gems. After a few days, I had decided to make a fairly large purchase, some rubies, emeralds, and other random gems. While I was there, a soldier had walked in and was admiring the emeralds. I could tell he was quite mesmerized with them and was telling the shop owner how his wife loved emeralds, but he couldn't afford one. He put the emerald down and I could see he was bummed that he couldn't purchase it. I asked if he wouldn't mind if I took a look at it. I pretended to be interested and told the shop owner I would take it. I also asked the owner to put the single emerald in its own bag. As I walked out with my gems, I handed the emerald to the soldier. He was in total shock. He was so excited that he had this to give to his wife. I just told him to pay it forward one day and I never saw him again. Story 7. A friend of mine goes out every Thursday night and feeds the homeless with soup, tea, coffee, jacket potatoes, and pasties. No one outside of our church would know he does it. He's been doing it for 25 years and knows most of the homeless by names. He feeds and talks to them and sometimes prays with them if they wish. I've got with him a couple of times and each night when I get back top my warm house I'd cry. Because yes, I realize how lucky I am. But also even thou, I'm so insignificant in the grant scheme of things I can still make a difference. I've since moved to another city, and now my little brother sometimes goes and helps the guy. I'm very proud of my little brother, but amazed at the other guy. He does it every single week, rain or dry, even on Christmas. He also looks after his own three young children. He's a Christian and a brilliant man.
Don't believe everything you read about Christians on our atheism. Not that I think you would. Story 8. A few months ago, I was shopping at GameStop and a younger couple with their little boy was perusing the same section. The little boy couldn't have been much older than four. I overheard the young couple talking about games that were age-appropriate for their child, which already got my attention as I think there needs to be more of this, but also heard that they had only $7 to spend. The little boy kept picking up a copy of Disney's Up for the PlayStation 3, to which his parents would continue to tell him it was too expensive. Not understanding, the little boy continued to pick it up, asking, What about this one, Mommy Daddy? I could see that both parents were a little heartbroken that they couldn't get the game for him, as he was not making demands or throwing a tantrum in any way. As their backs were turned, I picked up the copy of the game and brought it to the register, paid for it, and explained the situation quietly to the employee. I asked her then not to give them the game until just after I left. She smiled and nodded, and that was that. I've probably done something greater than that in my life, but this is the one that stuck with me the most because they never need to know it was me. Story 9. When my grandmother passed away a few years ago, my uncle was really broken up about it. We had a party at her house in her memory, and as he sometimes does, my uncle had too much to drink and passed out early. A few hours later, I was the only one awake and I saw my uncle sitting at the kitchen table. I tried to talk with him, but he was far too hammered. After walking him back to his room and putting him to bed, I realized that he had treated that chair in the kitchen as a toilet. He peed all over the place and there was a little cow too. I hadn't noticed at first because I had shoes on and was pretty drunk myself. Not wanting my uncle to have to face this embarrassment along with his grief, I cleaned it all up myself and never mentioned it to anyone until right now. He doesn't even know. Story 10. I just remembered another one. I'm $300 necklace guy. During the Occupy Toronto protests, I got to know a beautiful homeless girl. Let's call her Girlie. During the protests, I made an effort to talk to her and really make her feel like a part of the community. During marches, she couldn't walk very good, so I either wheeled her around in a wagon or carried her on my back. She always looked so happy when I was around. Then, of course, came time for the eviction of the occupiers. Fearing that things might get violent, right before the eviction I showed up, found her, and carried her princess style to a homeless shelter. I later found out that a fellow occupier inspired by this found her and let her share the apartment for a while. No one knows about this because I disguised my face during the protests. No one knew what I really looked like. Story 11. Other people know about this, but here it is. I'm sure it'll be buried anyway when I was in junior. Hi, a Bubby's older brother was in the army. While on leave, he brought home several training grenades. It was Saturday night and they were have a family BBQ, which I just happened to be part of the way neighborhood kids sorta are included without question. Well, older brother decides it's a good time to pull out the grenades. He tells us kids that they're the real deal and lobs one into the field behind the house. It goes off with an impressive bang and flash. In hindsight, it was obviously not real. But I was 12 and 12-year-old 12 boys are generally pretty stupid. Older brother then drops what turns out to be a completely fake rubber grenade on the ground and acts as if it's live. Without thinking or knowing it was fake, I just jumped on it. I'm sure all the adults were watching the joke and everyone is completely silent. After a bit, my friend's dad bends over and explains the situation to me. Emotionally, I was kind of a wreck. I got up, looked around, and walked home. I stayed in bed for two days. As a side note, I grew up in a really small town with just one greasy spoon-type diner. We'd go there after basketball games and stuff. I never paid for a meal there. Story 12. I really don't know how amazing this is or how nice. But my sophomore year of high school, I overheard a girl talking about how she had been accepted to a good college but she needed a certain grade to ensure she got a scholarship. The room I was in was a sophomore senior teacher. E.g., he taught a class of sophomores and a class of seniors. It was honors. Well, he had a habit of having students grade other classes' papers, quiz tests to lessen the load. Only students with X percent in the class could help him. I got her essay. It was her final essay of the class, and apparently it was the decider of her fate. I read it over and gave her an 85% initially. It was a decent essay, but not fantastic but I kept remembering what she said about that school and the look she had. So I gave her a 91% instead. Gave it to my teacher. He read it over and approved the grade. Story 13. So old, this will probably never see light. I had been planning on proposing to a lady I was with or quite a while. I bought the ring set and was trying to craft a way to express my love and creatively propose to her. I spent about a month trying to figure out how to do it, and I came up with an idea. A couple days before I was going to spring the question, I got off work early. I headed over to see her as that she didn't work that day. I pull up to notice a neighbor's car in front. You know where this is going. Walked into two of them playing on the couch. Music was loud enough that I'm pretty sure they had no clue I'd been standing there contemplating action or leaving. I left. For some reason, I took a picture. I don't know why. 
A few hours later, I got a text. Hey, honey, are you off work? I was about to walk into an Applebee's by myself. I wanted a drink and I wanted it somewhere more cheery. I ignored the text and started sipping my drink by myself. Get a few more texts and I just ignored. Then these two guys are seated behind me. As a distraction, I started listening to their conversation. Was the usual guy discussion for a bit. It veered off into a conversation about the one guy's girlfriend. On how she was cool with him going out now and then. How awesome she was. Then the story turned a bit depressive. Guy had been dying to propose to his girlfriend for a while, but he couldn't afford a ring. He really didn't want to get her a Walmart special. He talked about ideas how to propose. I let out a quiet sigh. I knew what I wanted to do. I sent a total of five messages go my girlfriend. Dropped $20 on the table for my drink after catching the waitress's eye and stood up. I turned to walk out and as I started to walk, I turned to the guy who wanted to propose and said, May your life be happy forever. Obviously, this was meant to happen. I was out to propose to my girlfriend, but I found her cheating. I quickly pulled out the ring box and dropped it in front of the guy. I was in tears at this point, and as I dropped the box, I was turning and moving. I said back to him, It's a gift. Use it for happiness. I passed the waitress who was coming my way. I set her on the way past. I left $20 on the table. I gotta go. I probably looked like a fool to the waitress. Yeah, I know. Stupid of me. I hope he used I to propose to his girlfriend. As for the texts, I sent the following. A picture of the ring. This ring was for you. I decided that someone else deserved it more than you. When I saw this, this afternoon, the picture I snapped earlier sufficed to say there was a mixed bag of reactions. Anger, apologetic, hostility, threats, and so forth. I simply ignored them. I didn't answer the phone. I ignored the door. I never saw or spoke with her again. Story 14. I grew up pretty poor with a single mom younger sibling. I also have four older siblings. There was an age gap, and they were all out on their own. We lived in a house with pretty cheap rent. The people we were renting from were good friends and kept the rent low. When it was time for them to retire, they wanted to sell the house and mom was worried sick that the new owner would jack up the rent to something she couldn't afford and she would have to move. It isn't a great house, but it is definitely home and mom didn't want to go anywhere. The home prices in my small town really aren't much compared to many urban areas. My brother and I decided to team up and buy the house for her. We didn't care much about the price and probably overpaid by quite a bit. We didn't do it for an investment or what we would get out of it in the long term. We did it for mom. We didn't haggle and just gave the landlord his asking price. And then we paid the whole thing off in about four years. Mom is in that house for as long as she wants to be. And I know I can always go home. Story 15. Um, is going to be long and grammatically messy because English is not my native language anyways. I'm a cop. My shift ended and I was to sign some legal papers and then go home because of my distraction and need to sleep. I took the wrong turn, which made me mad, so I pulled over next to a store and bought a cola. Suddenly, a running man, all excited and rage, starts mumbling something about an arrest warrant, his daughter and a high school near that store. I ask him to take me to her daughter. She was in his car, not too far from my patrol truck, in shock. Then he shows me a copy of the order to arrest him and a photo of the guy to who was issued the warrant and coincidentally, was with his friends just a few steps from the door and trace to the high school. Immediately call for backup, HQ told me there were no officers available. Thankfully, believe it or not, I must admit that the city I worked for had the best emergency response in the country. A patrol truck from another police institution passed by. I wave at them. They pulled over, explained them the situation. Once I showed them the copy of the arrest warrant, the offered help. So the plan was simple. They'll come one way and I'll come the other one and catch him in the middle. Them in their truck me on foot, and display the basic security protocol. But they had to wait to my signal. Basically, I just had to flash my badge or sidearm. Anyways, as I was in the middle of the sidewalk, five or seven meters, don't know how many feet is that, sorry, from this guy, and out of the blue, they turned on their siren and barge against him and his friends, as they, the guy and friends, looked shocked at the patrol truck. I ran and jump over the one in the photo, naturally. Two of his friends started hitting and kicking me while the rest of them ran away when the other policemen came at time to help me. Later that night, a friend called and told me that the gang was apprehended. I was sleeping so had no clue what he was saying. So I just said, okay, and went back to sleep. The other day I read in the news that thanks to a well-planned joint operation between local and state authorities, a serial kidnapping assaulting gang in the city, the warrant only said attempt of murder, was apprehended. And that thanks to that detention, five cases were solved but authorities hope to solve near 12. Never seen the dad, girl, or the other policeman again. Although I admit, I never expect or want the publicity or recognition at the end is my job. Story 16. Last year, I was at an airport awaiting a flight and realized that I had a good two hours to terminate. 
wandered into one of the many bar restaurants in the airport and sat down next to a group of six guys in uniform. They were all U.S. Army reservists on their way to their deployment to Afghanistan. Suffice to say, I picked up the bar and food tabs for all six of them. They tried to hand me money and thanked me profusely, but all I could say was that it was I who owed thanks to them for their service. I've sort of always made it a personal policy to pick up the food bar tab of anybody in a military uniform. It's the least I can do for their sacrifices. Story 17. I think it's knowing what evil you are capable of and refusing not to partake and turn the other cheeks. Digitally, I know I am capable of ruining many people's lives. But I know blackmail, forging documents, and extortion are what ruin my inner self more than I can personally perceive. In the digital age, you never know who or what is watching you. However, I used my digital art slash typographic slash manipulation skills to help a fellow photo student out. Their camera broke from a fall in the classroom and was about two months out of warranty. Seeing they had to get a new DSLR fast, they went to an unnamed big box store, where they tried to price match for a model with a competing store. It was a great deal and they were lucky to have found it. But since the competing retailer was not in town, they refused it. Note, this is a student who ate ramen for at least two meals a day and were in a few rough patches from life already. They needed a break. I didn't take that lightly. So I took another retailer's ad, worked my magic with the type in digital art, and presto, they now had a time-stamped printout from a nearby local store for the sale price. I am a humble mother just because sometimes I can more... So I taped a note to the printout with try again with this. A friend. They still do not know to this day it was me, but I know I saved them from having to go to three meals a day ramen on their already tight budget, plus more. Story 18. When I was about a month into being unemployed, money was running low. I pulled into the supermarket to pick up a few things when a homeless guy approaches me, gives me his story, and asks me to, but him some food. I say sure, go in with him and let him do his thing. We reconnect at the checkout. He gets his sandwich and thanks me profusely on our way out when I stop and hand him a bag of apples I wanted to gift him as a surprise. He is nearly in tears as we part ways. I never told anyone I know about this. This if the first I've ever related it. I could sympathize with him, knowing how easily Cal could go from bad to worse. So I was glad to help even if my bank account tells me I shouldn't. Story 19. I used to work in a hospital. There was a patient there who was very old whose SO had passed away years before. The patient was about 85. No one came to visit the patient except the patient's neighbor who was also in her 80s every few weeks. The patient's bed was beside the nursing station, so I would often go in and be able to speak to them while still answering the phone and call bells. I learned about the patient's life growing up in South Africa, about why the patient and their SO chose not to have kids, and basically the life story of the patient. Christmas time comes, I didn't have to work, but I made a point to drive down on Christmas Day after having breakfast with my family to visit the patient, and I also made the patient some cookies and gave the patient a card. The patient tried to give me money, which I refused to accept because I was not being nice to the patient to get money. This person was just a sweet old person who I began to think of as a grandparent. When the patient was well enough, they were moved to a rehabilitation center, and I went to visit them once a week. I ended up moving away from the city I lived in. Life got in the way, and I lost contact with them. But I always hope I made their life a little better, because the stories that I was told of South Africa and the patient's life stuck with me. Asterisk, I say the patient only because of privacy. Story 20. When I was in college, I worked for a pizza place. I had a buddy who had a newborn child with severe medical problems, the kind that are going to make him hit his maximum deductible every year for the rest of his life, paying for his kid's necessary care. One day, he asks me if I get any good deals on pizza, and I say, yeah, I get free pizza all the time, meaning that I got to take home any pizza that was made accidentally or no-show deliveries. Asterisk, he asterisk understood it to mean I could have any kind I wanted any time. So he asked if I could maybe deliver a pizza to his place once in a while. So every week for about a year, I delivered a pizza to his family. They got it and thought it was free. I paid my slightly discounted rate for whatever they ordered. Story 21, my friend and co-worker was 35 and riddled with ball cancer. She had two teenage daughters and a rat of a common law husband. To make matters worse, she was Caucasian and her kids and husband black. She was not exactly accepted by he black community in which she lived. We had great insurance, however, her costs were quite high. Remember, she had two ready-to-be adults, teenage girls. She wore old clothes and was just fighting the cancer all while trying to make a living. I knew she was struggling, but so was I. My kids were growing out of their clothes and my out-of-work husband was an alcoholic candy abuser. Even still, I had it better than her. One payday, I got $20 from the bank. When she left her desk, I slipped the money in her coat pocket. You should have seen her face when she found it. It was like she had found a thousand dollars. She knew someone had put it there, but not who. I told her maybe she just forgot about it, and this was a good time to find it. 
Fast forward a couple of months, she had to have the most severe type of treatment and left work on disability. When I would cook a candy of spaghetti or soup, I dip out half and take it to her house. Rack up another thousand dollar look on her face each time I gave her even a loaf of French bread. She passed away at age 37 after a long fight. The next fall, I was greeted at work by a bouquet. My friend had written to a magazine about our friendship and how it helped her through her sickness. The magazine posted my picture along with her story. She said it started with her finding $20 and knew it was from me. That was the best $20 I ever spent. Story 22. Around 10 years ago, I was driving home from work southbound I-15 about a week before Christmas. I was going through a major life crisis at the time and feeling pretty low. It was cold outside and snowing. The roads were icy. About five miles away from my exit, I drove by a man walking on the side of the road. I was driving slow enough that I could make out details of what he was wearing. Jeans, tennis shoes, an old coat, and socks for gloves. But to fast, to stop near him. So I kept driving. My heart sank knowing how cold it was for this guy to be walking on the freeway like that. I immediately took the next exit, got back on the freeway northbound and drove back around three miles to the previous exit, and then hopped back southbound with the intention of picking him up. Long story short, I picked Raymond up and asked where he was headed and told him I would give him a lift to my exit. We start talking. Apparently, he had just gotten fired as a Greyhound bus driver. He had a heart attack while driving a bus and was on his way about 300 miles south to keep his promise to his son to spend Christmas with him. He was supposed to take him cross-country on his bus route over the holidays until he had the heart attack. He said he was too embarrassed to ride the bus there. Apparently, he was not well-liked by his peers anyway, so hitchhiking was his only option. As he was talking, I saw my exit up ahead. I looked at him and said, Raymond, I don't have much to do tonight. I will drive you a few more miles. I ended up driving this guy 150 miles further than my original destination. Bought him a hot cocoa, pulled out $40 from an ATM gas station. Money I did not really have at that point. I was 20 years old with no concept of money management and gave him my brand new pair of snowboarding gloves that my mom had just bought me as an early Christmas present that I still had in the trunk of my car. Even though I know I went out of my way to help the guy, I felt bad as I drove away, leaving him there in the cold. But at the same time, feeling really good that I was able to help someone without being asked. I still think about the guy, especially around Christmas time. I hope he got to where he was going. Story 23. Some may not see this as the nicest thing, but it made me feel good. I was heading home from a friend's house and saw a deer on the side of the road. Someone had hit it and left it to pass away. It was still conscious and was staring into my window. I did some quick research on my phone and found a wildlife rehab group. I threw them a call and told them my location. They said it was going to be a while until they came by, so I spent my night just sitting around with this deer. It was around 3 a.m. I feel that if I didn't do this, it may not have gotten the same treatment I gave it. I wonder to this day how the deer is doing. Story 24. This one only tangentially involves me. Where I work, some people have gardens and fruit trees, etc., and get a surplus crop. When that happens, they leave it free to all takers in the common kitchen. One day there were plums, tiny little things not much bigger than grapes. It was a big dish of them, probably 100 plus, and no one was taking them. A couple days pass and they're now ripe to the use it now or throw it out stage. At the end of the day, I decided to take a few with me as I walked through downtown. I took the bus and needed to transfer. As the first bus was unreliable, I often just walked the couple kilometers to the transfer stop. Better someone use them than let them go to waste. I ended up taking all the ones that were too soft to last longer, probably three dozen or so. Nervous as hell, I started downtown and stopped when I came to the first homeless person I encountered. She looked like she'd seen better days for sure and was probably an addict. I asked her if she'd like some plums, and as she didn't believe the offer, explained the situation and showed her the bag, then offered her the whole thing. She took a handful of the mini plums, then thanked me and handed me back the bag. She told me she couldn't remember the last time she'd had fresh fruit, then pointed downtown and said, there are other people like me who would like some too. I was, and continue to be, amazed at this woman's willingness to share even in her circumstances. Story 25. I went out to a play at the local community theater with my girlfriend. And while I was walking in this older man and his wife, both of whom were very dirty and obviously disabled, came in, and I held the door for them. The play was pay if you'd like, and food was provided during the play as well if you wanted to buy it. Kind of a dinner theater thing. Well, this man and his GF wife went and sat down without buying the tickets, suggested donation, not mandatory to buy tickets, and then proceeded to watch the plays. During the various intermissions, waitresses came out to take orders and bring food. And the whole time, he and his lady didn't order a thing, but just watched everyone else eat. I snuck out to the kitchen and paid for the waitresses to bring the couple both the dinner option and a giant slice of cake each, 
and to say that the kitchen had just had some extras, and would they like some. When the food came out, both the man and the woman's faces lit up, and the dug into the food. They especially savored the cake. I've never told anyone about this. Only my GF who was with me knows. Story 26. Not me, my brother. He'd been out with friends, and at the end of the night they had gone home, while he was still wandering around hoping to happen upon a party. A homeless guy approached him and asked for a cane, and while my brother rolled him one they got chatting. My brother said he was a nice guy and he was pretty sure he was clean. He asked where the guy was staying that night. If I remember rightly, he mentioned a location under a bridge. My brother gave him his cane and invited him back to his flat to get warm. After letting the guy get cleaned up, the two of them spent the rest of the night chatting on my brother's sofa and noodling on his guitar. The guy could strum a tune. The next morning when he left, he thanked my brother for his kindness, and in turn, my brother handed him his guitar, telling him to take it in the hope that it would help him make some money. Story 27 when I was in paramedic training a few years back, we got a call for a car versus pedestrian accident. As we left the station to respond, it came out as an 11-year-old. A kid. Cow, I thought to myself. This just got real. We arrived on scene to see a kid sitting up, crying his eyes out. He said his leg hurt, and I noticed quite a bit of blood coming from his right tibia, shin. There was a nurse that had called 911 and was consoling him. When we showed up, he got strangely calm. We packaged him up to protect his spine. He had no seriously life-treating injuries as far as we could tell, and treated him in the back of our ambulance. As I cut his jeans to assess the blood, he looked at me and said, I'm really scared. I followed the rules, I promise. I looked both ways, and I wore a helmet. After the EMT I was working with started to clean the area with the fracture, compound, bone stocking out, I looked him square in the eyes and said, Buddy, you're doing great. We are going to have some doctors look at you, okay? I'm going to give something that might make you feel sleepy, but it'll help your leg that hurts. He was still scared, but he did really well, especially after a little IV morphine. As we dropped him off, the trauma team was waiting and we went to talk to the parents. His dad, tears streaming down his face, gave us all big hugs and thanked us. The best part was when the rest of my crew showed up. The engineer on my truck had loaded the kid's bike up on the back of our truck, didn't tell the dad or anything. He pulls me aside and says, I've got a project for us. We started fixing that kid's mangled mess of a bike that night and finished it up that weekend. Repainted it black with copper color flames, his favorite color. Did some custom metal work on it. This bike was one bad son of a bad person. We contacted our community outreach to get him to come and see us after he got released. We wrapped the bike up for him. His dad was in on the whole thing. As he came in on crutches, we had him unwrap his new set of wheels. Story 28. I had a friend call me who delivers meals to elderly people. She asked me if I could look at this old man's car. It had not run for a long time and he's on social security and could not afford to fix it. Being an automotive technician, I get a lot of people wanting me to fix cars for them. I went over to check it out and found that he had an old Ford LTD that had not been driven in a while, but was not in bad shape. It just needed a bit of TLC. It took around $100 in parts and a few hours of labor, but I got the car going. I went in to talk with the old man and his wife. Coming to find out, the man was a WWY vet. Him and his seven brothers all fought in WW2, and each and every one of them saw combat and came home. He showed me the plaque him and his brother got from Truman for being the largest family to serve in the war. He asked me what it was going to take to get the car going again, and I gave him the keys and said that it was ready to go. He said that he was on a fixed income and would not be able to pay me for a few months. I told him not to worry about it. He started crying and told me that he has not had a car for seven years because no one would take the time to look at it, and all he wanted was to go see his friends and family's graves. Before that, all he could muster was the mile walk to and from the post office. I still see him and his tiny little wife cruising around town. Story 29. This is stupid and probably won't get much attention. But my best friend of the last five years, I'm only 18, was having a really hard time. She took on 20 credits in school, five core classes, something like physics, C++ math, astronomy, and some other difficult space classes. And she was almost in tears every night and severely depressed because she was having a hard time keeping up on work. I am by no means rich. I work and go to school part-time and have way more bills than any normal 18-year-old, but I wanted to do something nice for her. I went to Von Moore, high-end retail store, and bought her a new Coach ID holder, roughly $50, and a giant cupcake from the grocery store. She really appreciated the gift and thanked me a million times. I felt good lifting her spirits, and she is in love with her new ID holder. Three edit. I'm an idiot. Story 30. It's not what I did, but what someone else did for me. I had a huge, huge blowout with my sister and was a huge sobbing mess. I'm sitting at one of the little tables in McDonald's sobbing my eyes out over this ridiculous fight with my sister when a total stranger walks up to me and asks if I'm okay. 
I kind of blinked at him and he smiled and said he hated to see people so upset. He offered me a hug and when I took it I just broke down in his arms. He let me cry on his shoulder until I was feeling better and then he left. I never got his name or anything. Random kind stranger, whoever you are, your random act of kindness has stuck with me even now. I will always be grateful for the simple bit of kindness you showed someone you didn't even know. Story 31. I make a habit out of talking to girls that seem alone slash out of place at bars and parties. I have a girlfriend, so I obviously have no intentions for them beyond simple conversation. It's amazing how easy it is to do when you aren't trying to take them home dot 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 ITS, almost like they sense it. Mentioning my girlfriend helps. I've even gone as far as pretending to be with a girl who was being creeped on at a bar by an older guy. She was very grateful and even bought me a drink. Also, it's amazing how the group dynamic changes when the shy, out-of-place girl gets attention over the hot, scantily clad members of her group. It's an innocent gesture that just makes me feel good inside to know that I just might have made her night. The cool thing is that everyone else in her group thinks I'm some guy hitting on this girl, but only myself, and most of the time her as well. No, that isn't true. Some girls are actually looking for a guy to go home with. In that case, I pass them along to my friends, who are amazing gentlemen, and I'd much rather have them with her than some random guy. Story 32. I've never told anyone about this, but I guess this is why internet anonymity is great. A couple years back, I had a friend that got in with the wrong crowd. Turns out the crowd was actually a gang. My friend hadn't known this at the time, but when he found out he was terrified, he stopped talking to the gang members, but they kept trying to call him. About a week later, a three of them found the two of us. My friend was freaking out. The gang members were pissed off and wanted to know where he had been. They started accusing him of wanting to go to the cops and whatnot. I told my friend to leave and that I would take care of it. He left and I tried talking them down and getting them to leave him alone. Of course they didn't like that idea. They got sick of me talking and all came at me. I'm not a very big guy, but I've been in quite a few street fights. Loud mouth, you know how it is. I was able to hold my own for a little while, but eventually the three of them were starting to overwhelm me. Just before I was about to give up and just take the rest of the beating, one of them pulled a knife. At that point, I knew it was not going to end at a beating. I separated myself enough to give myself some breathing room. The guy with the knife came at me and I dodged it, catching him by the wrist, then dislocating, breaking his elbow. I took the knife from him and held it on his neck, told them if I ever caught them near my friend again, I would personally come after them. Sounded pretty cheesy, especially considering my size, but my last move got me their attention. They got up and left. I held onto the knife. A couple days later, I met up with my friend again. He asked what I did because they hadn't tried to contact him once since then. I said we just talked, then I gave him their knife and said it was a peace offering. My face was pretty bruised and beat up, so I'm sure he had his suspicions, but he never said anything else about it to me. Story 33. Some people who know me know I worked as a camp counselor, but what they don't know is that I was a special needs counselor for kids with physical disabilities. Anyway, there was this hike that I would take the kids on, and it really was a hike, no heavy trails. You are out in the forest and it isn't easy to move through. There was this one kid who really wanted to go because earlier that day, a group of kids found some really cool birds fishing by the river. But this kid couldn't go because he was in a wheelchair. We had other things for him to do as well, but it looked like that wasn't in the cards for him. So I talked to a few people to see if there was something we could do to get him to the location to see the birds. And I asked him if it would be okay for me to carry him to the area. And he was stoked. So I ended up carrying him for about three hours on my back to the lookout spot and had a chair for him to sit in and binoculars so that he could see the birds. Story 34. I used to do a lot of community theater in my hometown. Last summer, a very prominent theater staged a very controversial production that depicted Jesus and the disciples as boy men. Most of the people who were in it were close friends of mine. It drew a lot of opposition from local Christian groups, but went up anyway. It still drew a lot of protesters throughout the five weekend run. It was incredibly hot, so I brought the protesters water. I disagreed with the protesters, especially the ones that called a couple of my friends sodomites. But I decided to turn the other cheek and do a kind thing for people who hated my friends for no reason. Story 35. I will never forget when I was a sophomore in high school. I had a severely depressed best friend who was threatening to terminate herself on a semi-regular basis. She had a pretty awful home life. She would constantly tell me, I'm going to terminate myself. It was nice knowing you. I'll be watching you from heaven etc. But she would never go through with it. One night, we were messaging each other on AIM, and she was saying the same to the sky remarks as usual. I would always take what she said seriously, telling her not to do it, even though I knew deep down she never would. She was just crying out for help, and I guess I was the only one who would listen. Anyway, she said, I'm serious. I'm done. I'm over it. I hate my life. I'm ending it tonight. I love you so much. I know you mean well, but this isn't the life for me. 
it's time to go, and she signed off of AIM. I was freaking the fudge out calling her messaging her all that nonsense. No answers, nothing. The next day at school, she went to school about a half hour away from me. I couldn't shake the feeling that something terrible happened. I was in my chemistry class, a nervous wreck, not knowing what to do. I stormed out of class, went to the guidance office, and told them what happened. They called my friend's school to see if she was in that day. She wasn't. I had absolutely broken down at this point. I called my friend's house, and her notoriously mother answered. I asked her if she knew if her daughter was okay. She said, I didn't know she wasn't okay. Is she sick? I'll go find her. I still to this day don't know exactly what happened to her. But I could hear the surprise in her mom's voice when she called for her. I could make out something about a rope in her closet. That's about it. I just know she was committed that day to a ward. Jeez, I get choked up just writing all this down. My friend still has issues, but she's doing much better these days since she moved out from her parents' home. I know I can't always be there to confront my friend's issues, but I'm just glad I could help that one time. Story 36. When I was a young lad about the age of 9, 10 I was in the local mall getting a new Ninja Turtles toy. I was getting the rubbery ones that were based on the live action movies, and I had always wanted a shredder, but they never had one. That day they had one, and it was all mine. I grabbed it and started to walk back to my mom. But as I did, I heard a younger kid behind me and his mom talking. The mom was saying to her son how he couldn't get a shredder because they didn't have any more, and he'd have to wait another day. Somewhere in my young brain, something clicked, and I walked back and gave that shredder to the little boy and just got something else. I know this isn't the most grand of gestures, but for some reason that has always been a memory of mine and has stuck with me.